Howdy, folks. Welcome to Redneck Gone Green. I'm your host, David Cobb. I am the redneck, and you bet I've gone green, and I'm trying to convince you and others to do it, too. A reminder that here on this program, when we say go green, we mean that in a number of ways. The first way, the most important way from my perspective is deep ecology, a recognition that we're not talking about mere environmentalism, mere conservation. We're talking about a recognition of the interconnectedness of all life, that whatever we do to the web of life, we're ultimately doing to ourselves because humans are don't own the earth. We are of the earth. The earth owns us if there is any ownership involved. But instead, there's not real ownership. There is instead relationships. And that's what we're pushing ourselves to remember. Because the second thing I want to remind us is that everybody descends from indigenous people. All of us have ancestors that were once in right relationship with each other and the natural world. Uh, for me, I know that that actually means going back to Scotland and Ireland, the Celtic traditions uh, of my ancestors that were pushed off of their land by the enclosure movement and the English empire. Why I have a particular hatred of the English empire, not of English people, right? But of the English empire, because all empire sucks. But for me and my uh, ancestors, the English empire are the bastards uh, that actually pushed us off of land. But the second thing, or the third thing is to really acknowledge, for me, green means green party, because I am a member and proudly of the green party. Uh, and I don't believe that the Democratic Party leadership uh, are going to deliver us to the peaceful, just, democratic, and, and sustainable world that I want to live in. But the other thing that I want to say is my commitment to democracy is why I'm really excited about our next guest, because our next guest is Terry Baricius. Terry is, and I want to be, uh, again, transparent, uh, Terry, I consider a personal friend. He and I worked together at Fair Vote, then called the Center for Voting and Democracy, where we were both advocates for ranked choice voting, uh, for proportional representation, for good electoral reforms. But Terry is now a heretic <laughs> because Terry is now saying to hell with voting. <laughs> Sortition is the way forward. So in that spirit, Terry Baricius is also kind of famous in some circles as one of the first two elected representatives in Vermont for the Progressive Party, a genuine alternative political party. Uh, he has been an elected representative himself, but now he describes himself as a recovering uh, politician and as somebody, again, who once championed electoral reforms is now championing sortition. So with that kind of introduction, Terry Baricius, welcome to Redneck Gone Green. Very good to be here. I do have to say that in the short term, voting in elections is still a valuable thing. I'm talking about a long term project. <laughs> you are indeed. And I, it was uh, you see you. You see, I did give a little bit of a setup for you, uh, okay. Terry. But again, I, I do want to actually own you and I come out of a political history, right? We come out of an organizing history. And I know that you're not saying not to vote, but you really are saying that the process of representative democracy should be investigated and challenged. Yeah. Fair? Yeah, very fundamentally. Yep. And so I'm going to actually invite you now to say, Terry, what the hell is sortition? All right. Uh, the elevator pitch. The idea is that co competitive partisan elections prime society and, of course, the politicians for the, the goal is to demonize each other and to say that the other people are evil or unethical, et cetera, et cetera. And often they are. but. Uh, issues become merely the means by which they engage in battle. The, getting the issues right and solving problems is really secondary to winning elections and maintaining power. I came to the conclusion that, well, I, we may get into the show how I came to the conclusion, but um, after 20 years as, an, as a lawmaker myself, 
uh, and working on election reforms for another decade, uh, I came to the conclusion that elections themselves are the one of the core problems of having a really functioning democracy. So I, I want to stop you right there yeah. because that's a very provocative sentence, yes. right? Yes. So what I heard you say were elections themselves are fundamentally a problem for democracy. Yeah, people, first off, it, I'll say the, the reform that I'm pushing and is taking off globally with hundreds of examples all over the world is called by political scientists sort, sortition. It's the use of random lottery selection to form genuinely representative deliberative bodies of ordinary people, not politicians, not special interests, ordinary people who then come together, have all the expert witnesses, cross-examination, hear all the testimony, and make conclusions and make laws without any politicians involved. That's the goal. And we're actually making progress. And when I say that uh, the elections are undemocratic, it's important to know that for a couple thousand years, all political theorists agreed with that. In other words, in Athens, they didn't use elections for hardly any offices. Almost all magistrates were selected by random lottery selection. The Council of 500, which set the agenda for the, 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 the assembly meeting, was 500 randomly selected citizens. The, uh, in the reformed Athens, they even stopped making laws in the assembly and, and charged randomly selected, nomothetai is the word, randomly selected lawmakers to pass new laws. So sortition is the roots of democracy, not election. Election came to be thought of as democratic after the American and French revolutions when the aristocrats who wanted to control things were opposed to democracy. It's important to know that people like Madison and Jefferson, people like, they didn't they didn't trust democracy. Democracy was dangerous. It would in, it would endanger the property rights of the slave owners and of the property rich. So they said, we need a republic instead where certain people, people with enough property, are allowed to vote and they'll elect their betters and their betters will be people like us, the elite white men of of United States and of France. Uh, and over the next 20, 30, 40 years, they started using the word democracy to describe this system which is set up intentionally to be an alternative against democracy. And now most people today don't know that elections for 2000 years, you go to read things like from Rousseau or other political philosophers, they considered elections to be an aristocratic tool, not a democratic tool. So I, that much I, I do remember uh, from the uh, you know the, the Federalist Papers, if you read it and so forth, what you see is a really scathing critique against the rabble, uh, against the idea of you know the the the, the ordinary person not having the capacity uh, to to self govern really right. Well, yes, capacity, but they didn't really, they were more concerned about what their interests were. <laughs> the ordinary people wouldn't protect the property rights of the rich. They would, they might actually vote to take away the property of the rich. And that was too dangerous. So they, they thought de democracy was something to be avoided. And, and then even in, even in the French Revolution, it's worth noting that when they did have elections, they would have an assembly of property owners, and they would then elect people who would then go to another assembly. And at that assembly, only these chosen few uh, from the property owners would then elect the members of the legislature. So they had a two-tier system to make sure that no ordinary poor people would ever be in any legislative body. So uh, thank you for that, Terry. And I, I will say that Jacqueline, who is a frequent contributor and participant, has written in to say, perhaps it's not the elections so much that are the problems, but the process leading up to the elections. I think that she's getting to something that is really an interesting thing. So I'm going to invite you, Terry, to react to Jacqueline's comment. Well, both are true. In other words, all the things leading up to elections, the, the money, the uh, uh, the, the nomination process uh, are, are problematic. The fact that 
who is willing to run for office? We have a system that removes all shy people, all people who are not have exuberant overconfidence. They're never even on the ballot. It's we have a subset of narcissistic egomaniacs. I'll put myself in that category for, for the moment <laughs> as a politician. Um, I feel seen. <laughs> so so I, yes. Yeah, so the point is that elections, the first step is to remove the bulk of the population from ever being considered. They're never going to be on the ballot. My, my next door neighbor, Bonnie, is one of the sweetest women, bright, competent, community minded. She's the person that goes out and, and rakes the green belt and does all the flower planting. She She's the kind of person I would love to have making policy decisions in my community for me, but she's never going to run for office. She's never going to be on the ballot. She's never going to be allowed to, to make any government decisions. So yes, there's all that stuff. But the point is, even if you fix the money problem in politics, even if you fix the nomination process, even if you fix uh, the gerrymandering, proportional representation, I support all of those reforms. But even if you fix every single one of them, you're still going to have a bunch of know-it-alls who think they know better than anybody else, who, who lust after power, they're going to be on the ballot. They're going to, you're going to have, maybe there'll be different political ideas, but they all want power is the first and foremost. Now, yeah, the Greens, they obviously don't want power as the first and foremost. They have a policy priorities. Otherwise, they wouldn't be Greens. They, they'd go in the Democratic Party. But the point is, with the partisan elections, you, you have a, a system that encourages the wrong kind of people to be involved, and it excludes the majority, the vast majority. I did the arithmetic. It's something like, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's something like 0. 0.9999, no, 99.999% of Americans are excluded from all governmental decision making. That's worth noting. So uh, I'm going to also bring in Kelly from the comment, another uh, frequent participant and contributor who says, it's that our politicians are bought and paid for by corporations. How would re you react to Kelly? I don't disagree with that, but it, but it's, it's, it's actually even more complicated than that. I used to advocate for campaign finance. Reform. I still can't advocate for campaign finance reform. It would be better if there was no corporate money, rich people money in politics. Absolutely. However, it's also worth noting, I, I had my eyes open by a, a multimillionaire who also hates elections and hates campaign finance because from his perspective, what happens the, is the politicians extort money from politicians. No, it's, it's, it's the shoe on the other foot. They say the politicians come along and threaten them with, with all kinds of legislation unless they donate to their campaign. So it's, it, it's, it's negative in both directions. It's just kind of strange. But the point is, even if you fixed all of the campaign finance laws, we have public financing, as they have in many other countries around the world, they also have very robust, they have much more robust sortition movements because they still have a bunch of egomaniacs, uh, mostly men, making most, most decisions. Because those are the people who want to run for election. Those are the people, in fact, there's been studies to show that the more people are willing to lie, the greater the chance that they will win election. The scientific research repeated has been corroborated, uh, independent studies that they do show that the more people are willing to lie, the better the chances they have of getting elected. Folks, you're listening and or watching Redneck Gone Green. I'm your host, David Cobb. I am the Green Redneck. I want to remind you that the only reason you're hearing and or watching this is because we are a source of non-corporately filtered news, information, and analysis. So in whatever platform you are receiving this information, I'm going to ask you to please like, comment, and share. And yes, I know that everybody always says, please like or comment or share. And you know why? Because it works. The way that you break out of the algorithms is by having people actually participate. So I'm really sincere when I say, please subscribe to this channel. Please subscribe to the Substack writing. Please join the community of Redneck Gone Green because our community really is growing. Uh, and it's because of ordinary folks like you. On our program today is Terry Baricius. Terry is a former elected official and a unique type of elected official because he was literally elected 
for the Progressive Party in Vermont. One of the great success stories for, and I won't call it third parties, I say alternative political parties, right? But yeah. what's really uh, amazing to me is Terry and I worked together on electoral reforms. And now Terry is saying, okay, yes, electoral reforms, but he's pushing me and you, the viewer listener, to even think deeper about representative democracy itself, right? Like so, a jury. Is so that Terry, you? What, 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 again, as you know, I was a trial lawyer, so I know about picking juries. Yes. I also know that's very corrupt, though the the the, the exclusion the, the the way that the lawyers try and construct a jury that will be biased in their favor, and so yes, we're not going to do it that way. But in the concept of a pure jury, randomly selected, genuinely randomly selected, uh, you could use stratified sampling like they do for polling to make sure you have every demographic group, ages, education, income level, uh, and you know what. There wouldn't be a majority of millionaires as there are in Congress. <laughs> it would be maybe occasionally you'd get one, but pretty much It'd be never. Super rare. <laughs> if it was truly random, it would be incredibly rare because millionaires are actually quite rare right. uh, when you consider the rest of us. But Terry, what I'm also intrigued by is the memory that Oh, like I remember discovering in British Columbia the use of citizens' assemblies, where you and I both got very excited about, hey, let's advance proportional representation exactly. and how much we learn from that. And what, like, what's intriguing to me is you've actually taken that and gone deeper with it. So yeah. I want you to describe to the viewer listener what the hell is a citizens' assembly and why did you and I get so excited yeah. about it? Well, uh, we were working on proportional representation, promoting that. And in British Columbia, they had three parties. There was, we won't get into the details of, of Canadian politics, but they, the party that won election committed to having uh, a relook at their voting method because they had really bizarre outcomes. They ended up with a parliament that had only two members that weren't of the dominant party, even though that party had gotten a bare majority of the vote, but all the other people, because they had a voting system similar to the United States, winner take all plurality voting, you can have really bizarre outcomes. So they agreed to set up a commission, basically. And they recognized that all the politicians had a conflict of interest because they all wanted to have a voting system that would help their side. So they agreed, some academics said, what you could do is take Take one man, one woman, randomly selected from every legislative district in the province, bring them together uh, for months. They would, on weekends, they would meet. They'd have all this uh, education, testimony from witnesses as experts. I was one of the expert witnesses testifying, saying, this is what I think you should do with ranked choice, proportional representation. And it was a very good plan. And in fact, they ended up adopting that. But anyway, the point is, after seeing this group of ordinary people randomly selected, being very earnest, very committed, really learning with no hidden agendas, no campaign donations, none of that, they did a better job analyzing things than any group of politician I, politicians I had ever seen. By the end of the process, I had been telling them how they should fix their democracy. I came to the conclusion that no, wait, this is what democracy looks at. This is what it looks like. This group of randomly selected people, ordinary people, they, they are the future of democracy. And the term is sortition. And what they were is, is called a citizen's assembly. And since then, it's taken off globally, not in the United States yet, but there have been literally hundreds and hundreds of citizen's assemblies in Australia and Japan, throughout Europe, like in the United States, a lot of people know things that like, well, in Ireland, they recently legalized uh, abortion and same-sex marriage, two constitutional amendments. So Americans know that, but what they don't know is both of those were initiated by randomly selected constitutional conventions of ordinary people because the Catholic politicians didn't want to cross the church. They are afraid of the issues. So they agreed, they set up a, a system of ordinary people randomly selected deliberated, took all kinds of testimony and witnesses and said, yes, we should do this. And it went directly to referendum and it was adopted. So Americans know 
the constitution changed in Ireland, they don't know is only due to sortition and citizens' assemblies. So, you know, what's interesting to me is when I think about, oh, the word democracy actually comes from Greek or the Attic Greek. And demos means the people and kratia means power or rule. So really, if you say democracy and you're talking about the, the Athenian system, you just mean the people ruling like collectively. And it's interesting because there's nothing about voting inherent in that. Right there, in fact, representative democracy is already a modifier of right. the idea of democracy. Well, to be and, clear, in my in my my preferred design, you would still have something like what I would call representation, except rather than being elite, power hungry white men of means, it would be ordinary people who would take turns in rotation being randomly selected, serving on a large jury that has deliberation. Maybe they would draft a bill and then you'd have a, a big jury of maybe, you know, 600 people randomly selected to hear all the pro and con arguments for and against the new bill. And then they would vote and there would be no campaign donations. There would be no lobbyists. There would just be balanced expert witness testimony. Um, and that is democracy where, where if you did it at the national, state, local, neighborhood levels, and all different issues had a jury for each issue, each new bill, everybody, every adult would serve as a lawmaker at some point in their life, maybe several times in their life, maybe once in the federal level, once in their city. The point is all of us would in turn be the lawmakers. So uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, Another uh, frequent contributor and participant in the Redneck Gone Green community is Dave, who writes in, we need to reorganize our economy and our, quote, political, end quote, representation will follow. How do you react to that, Terry? Um, I, I don't disagree that fundamental to society, how it functions, is the economic system. I've been a lifelong socialist. Um, radical anti-capitalist, uh, but you can have an economic system that is structured to actually benefit ordinary people, but if you have politicians in charge of it, there is a danger, as has been exhibited by some trials in the past, some experiments, that uh, the, th the, the thirst for power and maintaining that power corrupts. And one of the things about sortition is it's constant new blood, constant rotation. Nobody is vested in their position. They're in there for a short time. Maybe it's a few weeks, maybe it's a couple of years, depending on what the task is, and then they're out. Nobody can seize and hold on to power. So the economic system absolutely needs to be fundamentally reordered, but so does the political system. And one does not cause the other. Uh, you can't just fix the economy and assume that that our democracy will just run fine, because that has not been the case internationally. And you can't assume that if you just fix the political system, everything will be hunky-dory. I, I believe you need to uh, tackle both. And I'm, right at this point in my life, I'm focusing on the political realm. You know, I'm really glad that you you make that distinction. And thank you, Dave, for that uh, uh, astute comment uh, and uh, inherent question, because I try to remind people that we're talking about the political economy, right? That that really, if you uh, if we understand it, there is no such thing as a, quote, uh, uh, pure or free market society because the market itself is a function of political determination. People don't understand that markets don't exist unless there's a government to enforce the laws. Exactly, right? So so what we're always talking about is what are the values that we want to see our economy uh, promote? And that's why you and I are socialists, right? Like, uh, And again, you know, uh, we don't hide from it. Uh, like I don't lead with it, uh, but, uh, you know, 
uh, I am. Uh, I'm. I'm also an anarcho-communist, but that, like I don't lead with that because it doesn't really help facilitate conversation. One funny uh, anecdote about that: when I was first elected to the city council in Burlington, Vermont, along with Bernie Sanders, when he was elected mayor, uh, and a reporter would ask us that, we said, "Oh yeah, yeah, we're socialists," and and they didn't have a comeback. They didn't. It's like we they, they thought really that they were setting the you up. Dating. They, they, gotcha. had, they had nowhere else to go. It's like, uh, it's like, yeah, yes, but but on the municipal level, we obviously can't institute socialism here in the city of Burlington, but we can do things on behalf of ordinary working class people and empower them the best we can. But the banks are still here. We don't have the power to seize the banks, et cetera, et cetera. So if that's what you're worried about, you know, you can rest at ease. But but it, it was kind of funny to see red baiting simply disappear because right. the government was full of socialists. And, and that, that's the other thing, Terry, I'll say, like, I've actually had people try to, like, uh, you know, accuse me of being an eco-socialist when I'm doing public presentations. And I've literally shut people down to say, you know what, let me just, like, I'm going to actually go a couple of slides up. I was going to get to this, but I, like, here's the definition of eco-socialism and why I proudly advocate for it. Right. So you're right. I, I, they're not accustomed to <laughs> actual socialists. Right. <laughs> but I want to make another point here, which um, I made with uh, Jack earlier. Um, almost all of us who are engaged in political uh, dialogue and thinking and reading and so on, we have the opinion that we're right. You know, it's like and it, we could, it could be somebody who's a, a Trump supporter on the right or a libertarian or Georgist or whatever, we think that if we could just get a room full of ordinary people and explain things to them as we understand them, all the information we've gathered and explain it all to them, they'd agree with us. And the fundamental fact is sortition and democratic reform has no partisan flavor at this point because I have given presentations about jury model of democracy, sortition, randomly selected deliberative bodies to right-wing libertarian groups, and they're all nodding their head because they hate politicians just as much as I do. I don't, I don't hate politicians. Some of my best friends are politicians. They are individuals who are great people, but as a class, they're not good people. Right. And <laughs> right. So, so the point is, it can appeal to people of all political stripes who, who genuinely think that a political class running things in Washington, D.C. or in their state capital is not representative of the population, they're right. And the fact that we all believe that we could convince people means that maybe a jury model can appeal to people of all political stripes. So uh, you've really uh, instigated or provoked uh, some great uh, comments in the, in the comment section. So I'm going to turn back to uh, Jacqueline, who says, Terry, what do you think about online referendums for different policies? For example, the right to a universal health care service. Um, there's a fundamental problem with referendums of any sort, whether it's online or on ballot box. There's something that pol political science refers to as rational ignorance. If you have one vote out of a million or 100,000 or whatever, the fact is it is not rational and reasonable to spend a lot of time to learn about the issue, to do the research, to come to a, an informed opinion about it, because you know deep down that your one vote isn't going to make a difference. Because for your one vote to make a difference, it would have to be a tie vote, that your one vote breaks the tie. And that can happen in small municipal elections, but it really can never happen on a large scale. So because of rational ignorance, no, it's rational to not waste your time studying about issues. It means that in referendums, 99.9% .9 of the people who vote have a very cursory understanding of the issue. They, they can be easily swayed by uh, advertising campaigns, by their Uncle Luke, who pretends like he knows all about this, telling them how to vote on it because he's, he's re he read an article about it once. And so the problem with any referendum system is it's easily manipulable by people with a lot of money. Um, and it means that decision-making is being done in a, basically a half-assed way because what you want is a representative group of people who have no political hidden agendas, 
who can actually dig into the issue, really learn about it, really learn about the unintended consequences, the benefits of this proposal or that proposal, really understand it and make decisions. Referendums, I think, are, are um, basically a very bad idea because it, it gets the worst of both worlds. It gets rich people manipulating through advertising and, and everybody else not having the time, not spending the time to become well-informed because it's not reasonable. It's not, a, it's not worth your time to become well-informed because your one vote's not going to change the outcome. Catherine, uh, who is, uh, again, a, a frequent contributor, writes in to say, hey, did I miss how the people are chosen? And I think that that's a really important part of Sertition. So could you back up again and, and talk about the mechanics of it? Yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's any kind of lottery system. There's a lot of ways you can do it. Um, basically, you have to have a, a transparent, it could be with uh, drawing balls from a, from a, a, like one of those lottery machines. It could be uh, spreadsheets, it could be rolling dice. One of the ways that a lot of citizens assemblies have been chosen throughout Europe is they they send a letter to a randomly selected list of addresses and say, would you be willing to serve on a public uh, deliberative body that's going to tackle some issue? And the people who say, yeah, I'm willing, what is this? Then they do a second lottery and pick from the people who are willing a group that they then you do a stratified sampling to make sure that it's, you know, like half male, half female, half or, or whatever, all the incomes and education levels and ages is representative of the population. And then they bring those people together who have all been randomly selected. Now, that's not the perfect model. I would prefer some sort of mandatory like jury service, because the fact is that, you know, some people just are, aren't going to agree to serve because they they have low self-esteem or because they're not well educated but we need those people because you need the diversity the full representative diversity so i i'm i'm skeptical of the volunteer system but because it's most of these citizens assemblies have been non-governmental you know it's not by law it's it's been on the side um they they could not force people to serve and so on so anyway but the point is it's an open democratic lottery where everybody can see that it was not manipulated they can they can they can watch the process um in fact there are some on on youtube where you can watch them uh they, they one one place <laughs> going on about this what they did is they would do their random sample and they would create like a thousand different possible combinations of all those people that each of those thousand combinations met the criteria of, in terms of the age spectrum and income distribution and, and gender. So that each one of those would be satisfied to be genuinely, statistically, descriptively representative of the population. And then they threw some dice and, and they took the first digit and they threw some dice and took another digit. And, and they then they picked, you know, Panel number 742 was the one that was selected. And those were the people who ended up being randomly selected. So everybody could see it was not cooked. It was not, you know, manipulated. So, so Terry, so you're describing a very public process by which you demonstrate how the people are chosen. Jackie asks, I think, a very astute question. She asks, would these people who were chosen have to do their work or deliberation in the limelight? Because I can see a problem right there, she says. Right. Yeah, it. my notion is that you would have one deliberative body that is all they're charged with is helping to refine and perfect the system by which juries are chosen for future policies. Um, because quite frankly, we need to constantly be monitoring it. I would, for example, some juries, you might say, no, we're going to have them sequestered. No reporters, no lobbyists. Nobody's going to approach them and say, hey, I'll give you a nice, sweet job after you're done here if you vote my way. You might want to do it that way, like juries that get sequestered in, in jury trials and murder cases and so on. Or you might say, no, we're going to let the jury um, bring in witnesses, um, but we're going to have anti-jury tampering laws to make sure there's no bribery, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of details that, quite frankly, are going to evolve with time anytime a problem gets uh, surfaced. They'll have to change the rules to make sure that that doesn't happen again. But clearly, 
protecting against uh, lobbyist influence and um, bribery and offering people sweet jobs after they're done. Uh, all those things need to be protected. But the point is, in a jury, even if it's a large jury, you can set up the rules to protect against that kind of corruption. With politicians, you can't, because politicians have to be free to talk to their constituents, to talk to the lobbyists, to talk to the campaign donors. So politicians would never, ever, if they have to go to election, they can't possibly be, they couldn't be sequestered, you know, but in a jury, you can you can create the rules by another jury making these rules of what is the best way to protect the democracy in the long run to make sure that it's done, you know, honestly without any corruption. So uh, Dave writes in to say, forget labels, talk ideas for consensus. So I'm curious, Terry, that sounds very similar to part of what you were suggesting earlier, and I want to get you to react to that uh, that idea. Yeah, it's amazing that, uh, for example, in, in Europe, there have been a couple hundred citizens' assemblies, randomly selected juries, that have been tackling the climate crisis. Now, in, in Europe and most of the world, the climate crisis is not a partisan issue. Only in the United States, and maybe one other country, had, does it have a partisan flavor where Republicans say, oh, it's, it's not man-made or whatever. Every else in the, everywhere else in the world, it is simply not a partisan issue. But when they have called citizens' assemblies to tackle like resiliency and at the municipal level, what are we going to do when the sea level rises? What are we going to do uh, you know, for cooling centers if people don't have air conditioning, blah, 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 blah? One of the things they've done when they create a citizens' assembly is they wanted to make sure that the people who agreed to serve were not just a bunch of activists who think that the climate crisis is very, very important and so that it would be sort of unrepresentative of the population. They actually did a survey. Anybody who agreed to serve, they asked them, do you think the climate crisis is a serious problem, a, a minor problem, not a problem at all, or, or a fake issue? And they basically did a survey like that. And they would make sure that the people, to their stratified sam scientific sampling, that the jury that was finally selected matched in terms of their own view of whether the climate crisis was a big deal or not, so matched I the population. So. I got to stop. Like this is fascinating to me. Are you telling me that the 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 issue of the climate crisis has actually been put to randomly selected sortition juries? Uh, hundreds of them throughout the world. United States is unique in not having had any practically. However, it's worth noting that the citizens' assemblies in most of these places have been advisory. You know, it's the politicians relented to let them happen, and many times politicians. National governments in, in Scotland, in, in Germany, in France, many places have been nationally, the national government has called citizens' assemblies randomly selected to deal with certain issues. Macron got out of his crisis. Remember the Yellow Vest movement? The way he got out of that problem was by agreeing to have a randomly selected deliberative body of ordinary people tackle the issue of how we're going to deal with the climate crisis because his idea of a uh, oh. fuel tax, uh, diesel tax, and so on was so unpopular. This is this is actually reminding me, like in with Macron and the Yellow Vest movement, there were actually two parallel things, right? I yes. think it was the climate crisis, but also retirement. Yeah. Uh, like, didn't they do a like? I had forgotten they did a, a, a citizens' assembly version on on the retirement funding. I don't know. I don't know about the, if they did one on retirement or not. They may well have, but I know that the one on the on, on the climate crisis, they came up with something like 140 recommendations. And originally, Macron had committed to bringing all of the recommendations of the Citizen Assembly to Parliament for a final vote. He reneged on that. He brought a bunch of them, but some he, he, he backed out of saying, oh, there's constitutional issues and so on. But the point is, in places like France or Germany or England or Ireland, anybody who reads the newspaper, anybody who follows politics, they know about sortition because it's being used on a regular basis at the local, municipal, state, national level all the time. The United States is almost unique in the world. In Canada, it's used a lot. There's, uh, they use it for all kinds of things. The United States is pretty much unique in so many ways, but one of the ways it's unique is that it hasn't caught on to the mushrooming movement for democracy through uh, jury random selection sortition. 
Uh, I got to say, like, it, you're right. Like, when I hear people talk about American exceptionalism, <laughs> I'm like, actually, we agree. American is exceptional, but not in the ways that most most people who talk about it think about it. I want to circle back, Terry, because I'm also remembering about British Columbia. One of the things that was really unique about that Citizens Assembly was that the provincial government made an agreement up front that whatever that jury recommended would go to a vote of the people. Directly. Now, that's one of the amazing things. And that has happened in a few other places, too, around the world. Most of the Citizens Assemblies around the world have been advisory to lawmaking bodies, parliaments, city councils, and so on. But some of them have gone directly, as in Ireland. Uh, and, and in the British Columbia one, the, the, the Parliament of British Columbia said, we're going to set up this Citizens' Assembly, randomly selected. Whatever they come up with will go directly to referendum. But then they added this provision. To pass the referendum, it has to get a supermajority. So the recommendation they came up with was ranked choice voting, the kind of thing that you and I had been been begging um, them to consider. And that's what the Citizens Assembly said. Yes, this is the best voting system available in the world. They recommended it. It went to referendum. It got 50, something like 56 percent of the vote. We were defeated uh, because they had this special rule that they put in. So it didn't go into law. <laughs> we had, Yeah. I uh, remember like the mechanics were. You have to win a majority in every single riding, which was uh, at, like basically every uh, one of the district. jurisdictions, right? Every one of the districts. So you had to win a majority in every one. And in the aggregate total, you had to have a super majority. I think it was 60%. Yeah. It was 60%, and right? The funny thing was, so is, close that, to is that the, the vote total, percentage of the vote for the referendum was as I recall, um, this may not be right, but I believe it's true, was a higher majority threshold than the members of the dominant party in parliament had gotten. In other words, the politicians had set a threshold higher than what they themselves had won a majority of parliament by. So the, the referendum got more votes than the members of parliament did. <laughs> Right. I mean, uh, as a percentage, I think it, uh, one more example that you make about how politicians are self-serving, because <laughs> I, I also think that there's something, again, as an unapologetic leftist uh, who debates and struggles and, and tries to put it out there. I got to say, Terry, there's an I have this intuition that principled conservatives and and, quote, right wingers and left wingers would actually find a lot of agreement. Uh, on this approach, like, is there, am I yeah, right? In fact, here's an example that I, that I use. Um, healthcare, it's a mess in the United States. And the fact is that people on the right commonly use a phrase like, I don't want government bureaucrats deciding what kind of healthcare I'm going to get or whether this illness is going to be treated or what drugs are going to be on the approved list. I don't want government bureaucrats deciding it. People on the left say, I don't want corporate executives deciding what health care I'm going to get. I don't want them, these corporate profit seekers, deciding what medicines are on the list. But maybe both people on the left and the right could say, you know what? Take 500 randomly selected people, people like me, and let them hear all the discussion, pro and con, and let them design the health care system. Yeah, I, I could go for that. <laughs> yes. So listen, Terry, uh, I want to make sure that uh, you give an opportunity to share with people if they're inspired by this conversation, if they've read the Substack, listened to the podcast, watched the video, like what can they do to promote sortition? Where can they go to learn more? What's what's the step for them? Well, obviously, in the day of Internet, you can just do Google searches for sortition, S-O-R-T-I-T-I-O-N sortition. Um, uh, but uh, a couple of things. One is there's a bunch of uh, organizations, uh, probably one of them that I would recommend if you just want to learn about it is the New Democracy Foundation in Australia. Uh, they've got a, a huge library of information, the New Democracy Foundation. There's something called the Sort Sortition Foundation, which is based in the UK. Um, uh, and, and they've got a lot of stuff. Uh, 
In the United States, as I say, we're way behind, but there is something called Democracy Without Elections, DWE. Democracy Without Elections is a small organization that's getting off the ground that has monthly meetings and they try and do stuff. I have written a book about sortition. Uh, the title of the book is uh, the, every, say, the Trouble with Elections. Everything we thought we knew about democracy is wrong. And it's not in bookstores yet. It's actually being released for free on Substack as a, as a you know, every week or so you get a, a, an email with a chunk. And it's also all there uh, in the archive. You can read the entire book. It's, I, I think I'm like three, three quarters of the way through posting it. Um, so if you did a Google search for the trouble with elections, I put it all in quotes so you make sure you just don't get some other person's comment or Barisha's sortition, you'll, you'll get to my web, you'll get to my website or the, the organization it's, it's actually sponsoring it is called Democracy Creative. Democracy Creative is the group that's sort of publishing my book on Substack. So Terry, it's, this has been a rollicking conversation <laughs> and I knew it would be again, you and I are friends. We've known each other, uh, you know, it's been a while. I didn't have this gray beard when we met, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for example. Uh, uh, but I, I got to thank you. And I, I do want to give you an opportunity for any final thoughts. Um, gosh. Um, I guess there, there's two things. One is to understand that in the short term, I'm not saying down with elections, don't vote, it's not worth your time. I'm not saying that. It's the system that's in place right now, and your individual vote may not change the outcome of an election, but thinking of it as a collective group solidarity action, I think voting for the foreseeable future is going to be important. So I don't want people to interpret what I'm saying as don't bother to vote. I'm not saying that. In fact, it's worth noting that in one of my elections, I lost an election by one vote. So it can happen. Um, but, okay. but... I want to suggest that partisan elections are fundamentally an anti-democratic uh, vehicle that is actually damaging society. I'll, I'll give one, one more example of, of how I think partisan politics screws things up. Uh, when Obama was president, he before he was president, he was a supporter of single payer universal health care. Um, when he was president, he realized he couldn't possibly get that past Congress. So he took a Republican initiative that came out of Massachusetts. It was called Romney Care. Uh, when Romney was, was governor of Massachusetts, they had passed a law requiring people to buy insurance uh, or they would be taxed. Sound familiar? The idea was they would be required to have health insurance and they would subsidize it, but it was an individual mandate and they would buy it primarily from private insurance profit-making insurance companies. Obama took that model, reframed it a little bit, promoted it in Congress. They started referring to it as Obamacare. Remember, this was, I think, initiated like the Heritage Foundation or one of these right-wing think groups, Republican think groups had, had initiated this. Obama proposed it. Republicans said, well, well, if he's proposing it, then we're against it. The Republicans started campaigning against it. All the Democrats in Congress stopped talking about universal single payer health care reform, or even more radical, a universal health care where we're government sponsored, uh, where there was no insurance, it was just government sponsored is a more radical proposal, but at least single payer. Uh, all the Democrats jumped on board this Republican initiative that because Obama had put it forward and all the Republicans said, no, repealing Obamacare is our top priority. Repealing this Republican proposal was the Republicans' top priority. So the politicians were it was using healthcare as a way of opposing the other side, not solving healthcare. It was using health, not, not to say that individual members of Congress or Obama may have not have had wonderful intentions, but what happened in the partisan framework of the whole thing was it became a football. It was the game that you were playing to maintain power and show how evil the other side was. And so that's why I, one of the reasons, one of the examples of why I think that partisan politics in the long run has to be done away with. Terry Baricius, thank you so much. Uh, Terry Baricius, again, uh, a longtime uh, 
social change agent, a long time a proponent of electoral reform, and still is, and pushing us to think even beyond uh, uh, elections themselves and think about sortition as a way to bring ordinary people and empower ordinary people to basically serve as impaneled jurors who will then enact legislation. A fascinating conversation as I knew it would be. Folks, I want to thank you for joining Redneck Gone Green. Next week, I will be interviewed by our good friend Jack Rabbit, who normally is the producer of or is the producer of this show. Normally Jack Rabbit stays in the background. He and I were talking and he was pushing me to say, well, David, what's your plan? And uh, I took him up on that and I said, hey, Jack, why don't you interview me next week so I could lay out what my vision is, just as you often hear me or you hear me, I hope, week after week asking probing questions of the guests that I bring to you. Well, next week I'll be the guest. Uh, Jack will be asking questions. And so if you've been a participant, listener, viewer, uh, reader of the Substack, I hope you'll come next week, uh, January 16th, where we'll actually have the opportunity to ask those questions of me. In the meantime, stay strong. Thanks for what you're doing. We're getting larger, stronger, and better organized every week. And it's because of you. Thank you so much. Peace.